Hello, my name is Eva Howe, and welcome to GraphQL Fireside Chats, um, platform and data-centric use cases with GraphQL. This is going to be just a very casual conversation amongst uh, a couple of people who are very knowledgeable in the subject. Um, our sponsors today are Hesera and the Stat Labs. Um, I'm with the Stat Labs, and Tan Mai is with Hesera. And then upcoming events. We're going to do these um, over the next couple of weeks. So we've got one coming up on April 21st, and that's going to be performance and monitoring tips, tricks, and caveats with GraphQL. And then we've got one coming up on April 28th, which will be authorization and security plat patterns for GraphQL with Gago. I'm going to I'm not even going to attempt. Um, and then we've got one coming up on May 12th, event-driven applications with GraphQL and serverless with uh, Christian and Simona. Today, um, we've got Tenmai from Hasura. We've got Sasha from Twitter. We have Alex from Moon Highway and Eve from Moon Highway. And I will hand it over to Tenmai to start. Did we lose Tim Mai again? Sorry, what? <laughs> I think we lost you again. There you are. <laughs> all right, all right. There I'm back. All right, all right. Hi, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here, and uh, hope uh, hope you all are doing well and safe uh, in the pandemic times. Um, uh, this this conversation uh, is is going to be super interesting, and I'm very happy for um, kind of our panelists here. Uh, we'll we'll be talking a little bit about. Um, slightly atypical use cases of GraphQL uh, uh, platform, and what, what I call platform and data-centric use cases, uh, which are primarily APIs that are being used by you know, maybe the rest of your team, in, by, the rest of, by other teams inside the same organization, uh, or maybe it's used to provide an API integration to developers outside your organization. Uh, one of the best examples of a platform API is GitHub's GraphQL API, which is not really an API that's necessarily meant for you know, building front-end applications, but for developers to kind of browse, you know, the various objects and entities that uh, that that uh, the GitHub API exposes. Uh, so um, very excited to be talking about that. And uh, you know, as we kind of get into that conversation, uh, it'd be best to start with a little bit of an introduction uh, of uh, you know of the of the guests that we have today. So um, Sasha, if you'd like to quickly maybe introduce yourself and talk a little bit about uh, you know what you've been doing with GraphQL and uh, how you've been using GraphQL so far. Yeah, so um, I'm Sasha. I'm currently a software engineer at Twitter, um, and I used to be the tech lead um, of the platforms team at Medium, and we were using GraphQL at both. Um, and I guess uh, basically using GraphQL to um, power the main apps, um, so all of the like iOS and Android, and then also the web client, um, both at Twitter and at Medium. But yeah, I've been just using helping use uh, GraphQL and helping get folks um, moved over to GraphQL. So in both cases, kind of like a, a migration from, from REST. Got it. And, uh, and how far are, uh, is Twitter into their kind of GraphQL journey? Is, are most of the APIs GraphQL a little bit here and there? Um, a lot of, uh, so all of the Twitter owned and operated clients are on GraphQL. Um, it's still like, you know, mid process, but we're like fairly far along. Um, so that's like the, the main like canonical way of uh, building product features now at Twitter is using GraphQL. Got it. Awesome. Uh, Eve and Alex, would you uh, like to talk a little bit about, you know, what kind of stuff, uh, what kind of projects you've been doing at Moon Highway with GraphQL, what kind of different use cases you've seen? And of course, a uh, quick introduction. Sure. Uh, so we're Eve and Alex. We work at Moon Highway uh, and we teach GraphQL. So we work a lot with taking teams who aren't familiar with GraphQL and getting everybody on the same page. So our area of focus lately has been how do you take everyone on the team? So literally anyone who would be dealing with data in any sense, how do you get them to get excited about GraphQL first and foremost, and then to uh, really understand how to use GraphQL to their benefit. So we've been teaching a lot of workshops for like project managers and folks who might not think of themselves as, uh, I don't know, needing GraphQL and then teaching them that in fact, it's going to help them have more control over their applications and the process of development. And 
yeah, back end folks too. So yeah, if it if it's into the stuff, we're trying to really cast a wide net and bring more people under the fold of GraphQL than just developers right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had a lot of success of doing that with like uh, product owners and project managers and so on and so forth, which gets everybody in the room to help design the schema and to help make sense out of it. Um, and it really fits in with some of the stuff that we're talking about today because we wonder what it would be like to show up to an organization and like just interact with everything that you need internally at that organization through something like the playground um, and whatnot, so. Yep, yep, that's that's kind of exactly, uh, you know, one of one of the things that I've been seeing, which is that uh, what, what people really like about GraphQL is, um, a lot of people don't like building GraphQL as much as they like consuming GraphQL. Uh, so if you give somebody a GraphQL API, they're very happy because they're like, oh, look, I can browse of like, you know, everything that's there in my schema. And then all of the actions that these entities have, right? As uh, it's especially some of the work that, uh, you know, um, so for example, like Sean has been doing at OneGraph, but building out a lot of GraphQL tooling to make the API exploration easier and like lots of nice documentation tooling, which is just like a order of magnitude improvement over you know whatever uh, API exploration and integration tools people have. Uh, and of course, one of the big challenges there is that the kind of middleware tooling for you know GraphQL being an API between like service to service, right, in a sense, uh, is obviously uh, missing a little bit, right? So so that's that's kind of been one of the challenges. Um, what what would it be kind of interesting to hear? Um, you know, kind of when when a, when when I say things like like a platform or data centric API, you know what what that kind of means to you, uh, and and what are the use cases that you know you've encountered that you think uh, where you think it would shine, right? Like for example, um, just to take two examples, like two two kind of examples that that I've seen in the wild. Uh, one are um, in in large in large enterprises, right? Um, for example, imagine like a large healthcare organization, right? Um, you know you have so many different teams, so many different business verticals. Um, that people and that kind of browsing the API or like a platform API that might be organization wide or might span a bunch of teams is is very painful. Um, you know, it requires a tremendous amount of tooling and setup and education. Uh, and GraphQL could potentially help with that. The same way that GraphQL has been helping front end developers build complex applications today, um, and and kind of browsing the various entities and the actions that you can take on those entities or the transactions you can run. The other kind of use case uh, that I've also encountered is a very data specific use case where you know teams have kind of their own data um, and they want to expose that data to other teams inside the organization. And uh, and they obviously don't want to give direct access to the database. They want to have like a layer in the middle where they can you know enforce some governance rules, uh, you know do some kind of traffic management, right? Uh, understand what consumers are using, what slices of their data, right? What is more frequently queried or less frequently queried, and stuff like that. So, so those kinds of use cases within the enterprise, I've I've seen quite a bit of appetite for people wanting to use GraphQL, uh, and then kind of getting caught uh, in in a few places or in, where where GraphQL building GraphQL services is hard, um, and uh, and uh, especially kind of like an open-ended API, right? So you lose a lot of like the persistent queries benefit, and on the other end. Uh, people who are kind of consuming this GraphQL API, you know, they face uh, problems with the different kind of GraphQL clients that they have. But but those are kinds of the use cases that I've seen where where I think there would be a benefit to having a GraphQL API for you know platform use case or a data use case. I'm just wondering if uh, you know you've encountered stuff uh, where you think it would have been useful. Um, uh, Sasha, do you have any examples that you've seen at Medium or Twitter or you know just generally in life? Um, I'm not sure if I've encountered specifically a case where it would have been particularly useful, but I think um, maybe that's something people will end up seeing as more folks kind of get into the more like, uh, kind of like mature end of GraphQL. I think, uh, especially in the last few years, you know, GraphQL has kind of matured a lot. Um, so I think thinking about um, like, as people kind of start using GraphQL more and kind of like are getting into it, you know, like large scale applications are built with GraphQL, I think, um, like looking into kind of like the back end services um, and seeing how GraphQL could play in there is something that's interesting. Um, and I think the reason a lot of this doesn't end up happening is because uh, folks have already built out a lot of those services um, right. and they're already using something. So um, kind of the same with like, you know, client side and um, using GraphQL, like, you know, you kind of, at least, at least from my perspective, weirdly, um, the, a lot of the backend uh, folks were, were driving GraphQL at like all the oh, companies yes. I've worked at. They, all the backend developers are really excited about <laughs> it um, to like help out clients because like that contract is so weird. 
Right. Um, right. And so I think it took a lot of like selling and like getting, you know, client developers excited. And I think it would probably be, it seems like it's the same kind of thing where it's like, if, you, if you've been working right. a certain way for so long, um, you might not realize that like, this is something you would want or need. Um, but right. I think there's something there. I just, I, I don't know if GraphQL is like, I, at least or folks are like, you know, have been using GraphQL long enough to right. know how that will look. Right, um, right. And, and have you seen, uh, and have you have you come across examples of uh, you know like uh, using external services like APIs provided by external like SaaS vendors that use GraphQL right like for example GitHub has a GraphQL API or um, I, I don't actually know too many other examples of 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 vendors that provide a GraphQL API alongside their REST API uh, but even things like uh, I think so for example what uh, you know what what uh, OneGraph is doing where they're trying to create like you know wrap over a bunch of different SaaS services and provide a GraphQL API um, have you uh, have you uh, have you seen cases like that, or, or you know, what do you feel about cases like that, uh, given uh, given the kinds of things that you've worked on on the back end? Um, I think so. At least for I mean, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe eventually, like everyone will be using GraphQL, and it'll just be like you know the the new thing to use, and no one will use REST anymore. I think uh, even even at Twitter, um, the like a lot of public facing APIs won't use GraphQL, and at Twitter, even our public facing uh, API is um, it still uses rest and for like third party related things um we still use rest weirdly it for us it's also powered by graphql just under the hood but on top we provide rest endpoints and like under that we're <laughs> they're actually just using graphql so that's like maybe the one case where we're actually using graphql sort of for like a service to not service to got service it. but sort of got yeah it. got it and and i'm guessing the use case there is that it's kind of like a it's almost like a persisted query in a sense right like a rest api is kind of like a is like a is like a persisted GraphQL query. Is that does that make sense? Is that the reason why? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. The the whole. I mean, we're we're big on the like ad hoc query thing. Um, that that like blows people's minds when you talk about it. You're like, well, I mean, really, GraphQL is just a bunch of ad, or ad hoc endpoints. Sorry. Um, right. And so yeah, people get excited about that. But yeah, the because um, for providing like third party uh, like customers with. Uh, a REST endpoint, that's easier for them. And you can kind of like tie down like what exactly they can like query for by just making it like a REST endpoint. But then right. under the hood, they're just making a, a query. And, you know, our GraphQL uh, service already had all of the, you know, supported all of the things that the folks making the public uh, like third party APIs um, already right. needed, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember uh, there's a very nice tool that uh, uh, Uri and the Guild folks have worked on called, I think, I think they call it Sofa, am I, am I right? Like Sofa is a, it's a REST to GraphQL converter. It's like basically a REST API gateway for your GraphQL service, uh, nice. which kind of helps you automate a little bit of a uh, little bit of that effort. Um, at uh, uh, you know, what kind of like the in in terms of like the from the GraphQL service that that you have running today, um, are there kind of tools that you have around, uh, you know, kind of tools that you set up for, uh, you know, doing some of that kind of traffic management or API governance kind of stuff that we see very commonly for API gateways. Uh, but has have has any of that kind of tooling uh, starting? Has has any of that started to get built inside uh, Twitter or Medium, where uh, or, or just stuff that you've come across, where uh, you know handling handling the problem of being able to make queries, you know whatever query you want in production, like kind of like the way GitHub's GraphQL API is. Um, has has there been any kind of movement on that side? Um, I don't not necessarily tooling, but. Um... But like there's, you know, obviously a bunch of um, like existing things for metrics that, you know, Twitter uses and Medium uses and a bunch of companies use. Um, but um, the main thing is for, so people can't like, you know, DDoS anybody. Um, we do what I think a lot of people do, which is uh, we like whitelist. Uh, we have like query IDs and we whitelist them. So there's only right. specific queries that you can make. And if you try to make anything else, it like won't work. Um, and that seems to be pretty good. Um, I don't. Medium had just started doing things like query complexity to help with that too. Um, but that's mm -hmm. something that you have to be really, you know, um, careful about. I don't know how, yeah, you have to, you have to, you know, go through and like each field, like, you know, how, how, what's the weight on this? And it's kind of a whole thing. I haven't seen, I would love to see something more around that because I think that's yeah. something that's really cool. But yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's very interesting also because like it's not necessarily like the, the ergonomics also of a dynamic. Query complexity analysis are also kind of is also kind of weird, right? Because you might it, it even if it is possible to do like for example the, with the work that we are doing at Hasura, it's quite easy for us to determine the you know the cost of a GraphQL query 
uh, because, because we have deep insight into the database and into the other services that we're quer querying. So it's easy to kind of put together that cost dynamically. But it might not be good to expose that as a service level control to the consumer, as a quality of service level control to the consumers, because you might suddenly notice that suddenly some queries work that did not work before. Right? From an integration standpoint, it's, uh, it's not very ideal to have uh, queries that sometimes work and sometimes don't work. You know what I mean? Like in development, this worked, or but at 5 p.m. it doesn't work because uh, because the dynamic kind of cost analysis has said that this query is too expensive. So, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So there's challenges there as well. Um, uh, Alex and Eve, like, what kind of uh, you know when we talk about like the platform and data centric APIs, uh, you know, what kind of excites you about those use cases, and you know, have you uh, what kind of challenges do you think uh, uh, that that are kind of there that need to be solved? To, to kind of push towards that kind of reality. Well, one thing that's interesting, and I find this like um, that Sasha just said, it's like still rest is easier to, to work with for clients. So a lot of it is just working knowledge. Like, like when people understand GraphQL, you don't have to explain that to them. So part of the whole like training or onboarding or anything is like, okay, well, here's where our APIs are. And if everybody knows already how to go search for queries and how to do those queries and whatnot, that's, that's, you reach like, that's what you need in order to really communicate around this. The fact that when I when I started in the work world, it seemed like everybody knew SQL. Like everybody's right. college had an access course, no matter what you were doing. And when right. you would show up to places, like right. we used to have a, uh, at this one consulting agency I worked with, we used to have a receptionist that was a graphic artist, but she also did all of the student administration for um, our classes. And like, no one said, hey, this is SQL and so on and so forth. We were just right. like, here's the database. We need to know like what students are in when a student registers, oh, oh, you need oh, yeah. to insert them there. And like, so I feel like it's just, it's just like broadening the knowledge of understanding yeah. because there's right. really like, oh, you need to get data. Well, that's a query. And here you can- right. You can see the schema. Oh, you need to change something? Well, that's a mutation. And right now we're teaching that right. when we're teaching how to access the API and stuff. And then if exactly. we get really excited and we start showing like all of the advanced stuff you can do, you start to really right. overwhelm the people <laughs> who are right. coming in. And that's, I think that's part of the reason that rest and things like that are still easier, you know, like yeah. so knowledge and just getting everybody on the same page. So you're like, okay, you know, GraphQL, great. So we don't have to have those conversations um, about those things, you could just kind of cut people loose on APIs and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think that's what, when it comes down to like GitHub and things like that, people are still using the REST APIs, you know, right. like the GraphQL API is something that maybe, maybe people have tinkered with and played with, but when it comes down to it, like sending those REST queries, they already have it in their wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and it's also like a little less complicated. The GitHub API, you have to make sure you have a key that you send to do queries that you could do publicly without a key and the rest right. API and stuff like that. So a lot of it's just like lowering the barrier to access. Got it. Got it. The Got other it. thing that I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say the other thing about it is it really is about communication too. So what we really come across is this, or like think about this use case, you're at a startup, right? And you have all of this domain data, you have like customers, you have users, and then you have people come into that startup. And ideally you want to build these, your employees, all these great internal tools and all these great internal clients that have like great interfaces and stuff. But if you're moving fast, you don't have time to do that. So if you're building your domain and stuff like that out of GraphQL anyways, you can have people come in and begin to get the data they need and begin to send the mutations they need. One of the features that I love of the playground is just, okay, so you can write the query and then save it in that tab. And then every time you open the playground, just hit play. It already describes the data that you need to do your Excel report or whatever. Um, but what's really key to making that work is schema design that makes sense, like good schema design for human beings and for human consumers. Because what we see sometimes is that the schema has been designed by um, super technical developers and it doesn't make sense to like everybody like on the team it doesn't make sense necessarily to project managers and stuff like that because as opposed to using good uh domain uh, language language yeah. for what the, you know what i'm saying that makes sense to everybody who works at an organization there's a lot of like underscore db lose stuff that's within the schema and that's also a barrier to entry so a lot of it is just about like knowledge and understanding but also making your actual schema for your api super approachable makes 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 sense and i and i think i'm um, looking back at like uh, university i remember that there was a i think there was a course on web web technologies or something and there was this um professor who was trying to he was talking about soap and wsdl 
And I was like, what is even happening? And this is just like five, <laughs> 10 years ago. I'm like, why, why are we talking even about soap? Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, considering that that was the lag, I think, yes, it makes, uh, makes sense that there, there is definitely kind of like a default tool set problem that's, uh, th that, that REST has kind of been through, has kind of crossed because it's been, it's been a while. Um, one of the things though that I've also encountered is a, is a challenge, especially in enterprise environments, right? Um, is so, so one of the, one of the things that kind of blew my mind a few years ago was realizing that most of the APIs in the world are actually internal APIs. So it's like, turns out that 90, 95% of the APIs are not actually APIs that backend serve to front end applications, which I mean, why would it be? It's just me being a noob, but, uh, most of the applications actually, mo most, most APIs that exist today are, are, are mostly like service to service or, you know, business to business or team to team, right? Something like that. Um, you know, whatever the API consumer does with it. And I think, um, and I think, and I think that because of that kind of pervasiveness of APIs do, doing so much work, right? Um, it becomes really important that a the APIs are simple to build, so it's easy to kind of build a stand up a REST API, uh, and the tooling around REST APIs kind of keeps improving, right? So, uh, so 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 there is that, but there's also the element of like the rest of the kind of ecosystem tooling, right? So for example, the way you think about the way one thinks about like authorization, like resource level authorization, right? So you have REST endpoints, and REST endpoints have uh, have authorization that's tied into like uh, authentication systems that, you know, enterprise systems have, right. And there's so much tooling that's kind of happened there for rest, um, that that kind of tooling is missing for, uh, for seems to be missing for GraphQL, or at least that's what I encounter from, uh, when, 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 whenever I chat to people in enterprise and they're kind of thinking about GraphQL, you know, those are kinds of some of the things that they, the, that they, that they're worried about that they think about, um, how has, uh, have, have you encountered any of these kinds of things? Um, uh, Alex and Eve, like in, in the, in, in kind of like when you, when you're talking to, when you're talking to backend developers in terms of their concerns with, you know, using GraphQL for building out their API, uh, you know, what, what have you seen there and what kind of, what, what do you say to them? I think and in this case it's totally different because they're like, oh, we're backend developers and we all want to use GraphQL. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody else. <does. laughs> yeah. Not always the case at our courses, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, I think for the most part, the first kind of dip your toe into the pond of GraphQL is always like a client story. Like how do we load some data into our user interface? And then uh, the internal APIs, perhaps just because client developers might be a little more excited in a lot of cases, uh, they start to, um, I don't know, we haven't seen as much internal tooling about that. Um, we've seen a lot of questions about like, how do I take my Excel, <laughs> I ask this question with this database and uh, or Excel or something like that. How do we port that over to GraphQL? And I think that, yeah, just tooling and knowledge around that stuff would be interesting. What else? Yeah, is, yeah. it's just like using um, using the playground for authors. It's more about how yeah. all of the authorization gets built in and how you do those levels or query complexity or or user roles and what they're allowed to access and so on and so forth. Um, right. And I don't. I think that that stuff is an interesting, like it's, there's a, those are complications that like are part of just like the world of programming, I think. Um, but one of the most interesting things is, is like a lot of the backend people we teach, JavaScript isn't their world. Yeah, It's usually like Python or Java and stuff like that. So it's like a lot of the stuff that we're teaching is still in JavaScript, but like we're not just selling GraphQL, we're selling JavaScript too. And sometimes right. that's a hard sell. <laughs> Unlike back in people like <laughs> Sasha's laughing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, there, yeah. <laughs> um and, and and so uh, what is the what is the what is the GraphQL stack? Uh, uh what are the I, I think uh, if I remember right, it was it was Scala at uh, at Medium for you, Sasha, and then at Twitter is that is it Scala too? Yeah, it's called it at both. Um, weirdly, Medium's kind of like a special case. Um, Medium stack was mainly um, so like JavaScript, and it was I I won't get into the specifics about like what um, different things we use for on the front end because I was not a front end developer, and I probably can't really say because um, I don't you know I don't know. Um, but the back end was mostly Node.js, um, and then we had a bunch of like different Go services. And um, originally our GraphQL server was written in Go. Um, I don't know if there's like Go fans out there anywhere, but um, it weirdly like GraphQL and Go, at least to me, um, when we built the, the GraphQL server, just they don't, it doesn't really fit quite well. Um, 
like just how like the types work out and like go still I think does not support generics. So it was like a whole thing. So we tried it out and it didn't work at all. There was like a lot of like reflection going on. So we ended up rewriting it in Scala. So that's how it ended up being in Scala, but nothing else at Medium was in Scala. So that was kind of like a different challenge in itself. It was right. um, getting folks onto GraphQL and kind of like into Scala at the same time. But for right. the front end developers, um, it was kind of like the promise of GraphQL and React. It's like, if we switch to GraphQL, you also get React because it's gonna, we're gonna do this like whole migration. So that was kind of part of the selling point was like, you get these two awesome things, so. Right, right. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, what kind of like, and what kind of like tooling did you have to set up for, for doing the stuff around? Like, how did you handle kind of like the security tooling and the, like the DDoS protection tooling? Like, what was, what was that like? Um, there's not a lot of there. I mean, both at Medium and Twitter, there's not a lot of uh, like tooling um, around those types of things. It's kind of um, a lot of it is sort of baked into what we already do, um, which right. is sort of unfortunate. And I think, I mean, I, I think this is everyone probably agrees with this, but uh, GraphQL. I feel like a lot of the like at least the auth stuff is just it's a little clunky. Um, and and on the like even the GraphQL kind of like docs and kind of how they explain like you know this is maybe how you could do like authorization stuff. Um, it still feels a little clunky, and I think that's something that is I don't know if that's anyone's kind of like looked into that more or you know has come up with like kind of like a easier way to do it. But I think that's part of um, one like one of the challenges when people kind of migrate to GraphQL is like it's not super <laughs> clear or easy to do right. that as it is in REST. Um, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, and I, I, I yeah. I, I, one of the things that one of the things that has worked well for, uh, uh, for 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 our users and the way that we do things is that we specify kind of the so so a lot of the times like the the authorization logic ends up being very kind of close to the data fetching logic, um, right? It's fairly like um, it, it's fairly close to like the data that you're fetching kind of contains the constraint for whether that piece of data is accessible or not, right? Um, or, or maybe because when you're kind of making that data fetch to, to a bunch of different data sources, that's that, that the authorization check is also very closely related to that. And oftentimes it turns out that you're doing that work twice. Uh, and what we've noticed is seems to be um, easier from, from just like reasoning about the entire system is to uh, kind of create a, a kind of create an abstraction for putting in authorization uh, very at the model level, right? So each kind of model has its own authorization checks. And so now when the resolvers kind of fetch these models, um, you know, whatever, whatever, uh, however, however you fetch all of these models, whatever path you take from the resolver, like you fetch top level user and their tweets, or you fetch like the tweet and their user, right? Like you're taking different paths to fetch the same model. The authorization constraints automatically get mixed in and deduplicated and linked with the data fetch logic, right? Which which results in a huge, um, like a performance boost as well, but also just like, it's easier to reason about things, right? Because you, you're, it's it's easier to, it's especially in like these kind of platformy kind of environments, it's very easy to think about like, oh, here's a health record for a patient. This health record is accessible if, right? It's easier to think in that kind of object model rather than thinking about it at a resolver level that you know if we access data this particular way then we'll have um, authorization checks so so that's kind of that's kind of one thing that we've seen especially for like the platform and data centric use cases that that work really well it's kind of like embedding those authorization constraints uh, at the model level in a way that it plays with the data fetch logic uh, well but i'm wondering how uh, you know what what experiences uh, you folks have had and what you've seen with respect to authorization and what seems to work so far actually can i ask you a question about that Sure, sure. So when, when you, yeah, when you tie these authorization to the model, how do you how do you set up your users? Is it like a role based system, or would you say it's like permission based system? Like you have read access to this model or something like that? How do you go about setting that up? Yeah, it's kind of a rule. It's basically a rule engine, and the and and rules are and rules. Every rule has a label. Uh, so so you you can create rules, and rules have labels, and then to every model you can attach a set of labels. Uh, so labels are basically like the name of the rule, right? So you can say that this model uh, for a label called user or administrator or editor, these are the rules. Uh, and now if any anybody comes to access this model through a resolver, like however, ultimately it will get accessed. Uh, if that incoming kind of uh, request has, has these labels, then use those rules. 
to to validate against and the rules themselves could be something like you know access this document if you're a paid user or access this document if the document.groups contains you or the document.groups.editors contains contains your current user or whatever right so the rules can be arbitrarily complex right um, and and they can depend either on the user or the data and then that kind of rule engine which is and so now when the data fetch happens so when you kind of need to make the data fetch to fetch that data and say you know select this uh, this this document uh, that constraint actually gets compiled into the query itself. So it becomes like select from document where, uh, and that happens. So if it can be, if it can't be compiled in, then it's kind of still done after, like it's a post after you do the data fetch, you check. Um, but uh, but that's kind of how, that's kind of one way that we've been thinking about authorization that makes it like makes it very convenient because then you're kind of independent of resolvers, right? You're like, oh, whatever the resolvers do is fine. Because ultimately if I know that if this model is fetched, it will always be fetched with the right rule and check that will happen. Um, so that that kind of that kind of has worked well so far. But uh, I don't know uh, how how yeah. What what have you seen for authorization? Or like what what works well for authorization? Um, yeah, we're just everything that we do is just simply like identify the user and then send a token. <laughs> over over the channel and then like oh you're logged in yeah you're allowed to access everything so that's why i was like <laughs> curious so we've discussed with our students who ask these questions we'll get on the whiteboard you know and draw out how to make a rules-based system or and that's right. why i'm sort of fascinated about this stuff like rules authorization we, we want to know what those patterns are and stuff um but yeah we haven't really done like too much specific stuff yeah, with got that it. so got it um, got it yeah yeah that'd be interesting to talk about i'm sorry sasha what you saying Oh, um, so one of the things that's sort of interesting about this um, is we're kind of, you know, getting into like how like data access um, and it's sort of in some ways it's not really a GraphQL like specific right. issue, right? It's like not, it's related to GraphQL and I think with GraphQL people, you know, get into it. Um, and I think so like when I talk about, you know, and I think when y'all are talking about, you know, like you just like pass a token it's like well yeah it's like you know at the graph at the graphql level there's not like a lot that's going on but it's kind of interesting what happens below that and i think that sort of gets into um that sort of maybe gets into like the apollo federation stuff it's like we're now we're kind of like at that level um and like for twitter it's sort of uh similar to what you were talking about tanmai i think um we use so we use like strata which is a thing that no one else can use because it's like a twitter specific thing um <laughs> But it's like the like the virtual database thing that sits on top of a bunch of other Twitter services, and at that level, that's where a lot of um, like the constraints and like permissions and stuff are defined. It's like you can access this, you know, like it has these permissions on this like column. Um, we call them columns, and like right. depending on like what gets passed through, you may or may not be able to access the data that that column provides. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, yeah, no, yeah. That that makes sense, and and then I'm guessing like the that kind of strato system does the optimizations to make sure that the auth stuff and the data fetch stuff is all kind of done uh, appropriately. Um, right. A lot of that is is done at the, it, it kind of depends. Um, right. A lot of it's done at the GraphQL layer. Um, oh. We do like a bunch of caching and stuff, but there's other stuff that happens. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on, but yeah, there's, right. there's right. <laughs> optimizations and stuff that happen at kind of like all the levels. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Like, I think like, for example, like one of the, um, I mean, I, I, my, my, I got into GraphQL very accidentally. Like we we were building a data access layer with JSON, and we had our own JSON-based query language and whatnot first, and then and then you we were like, oh, okay, cool. So it seems like GraphQL seems like a better JSON API than you inventing your own API. Um, and so so a lot of these problems are things that we kind of thought about. And then when I discovered that you have to essentially write these authorization rules differently for each resolver, I was mind blown. I felt like I felt like taking like smashing my head against a wall a little bit because it's it's very confusing because some like for example if I want to fetch like let's say I want to query comments right uh, I I know that there's an authorization check there and then if I want to query a document and the documents comments right the the document dot comments resolver is kind of different from the comments resolver right they're both like different resolver functions and that means that I have to duplicate like my authorization check in both of these places. Um, and then sometimes it's not optimal because when I'm fetching, when I'm doing documents dot comments, the authorization check is implicit in the fetch because I am fetching documents and comments together. But when I'm fetching comments just by themselves, I need to check if the comment dot document is accessible for is is accessible is uh, for for the end user. You know what I mean, right? Like it's it's uh, 
there are different optimizations, but the same logical rule, like it's the same logical concept that that we have from a security point of view, but it's but it has to be implemented differently. Um, and the trade-offs are weird. Except like if you do it at the model level and the system does it for you, like you have an intelligent data access system that does it for you, then it's great. But if you don't, then it's very painful. So um, so yeah, I, I I basically have have I don't know what to do about this. Uh, so so that's that's been something that I've that I've thought about quite a bit. Um, it, one of the things that it does seem to me that is easier in REST is because REST kind of seems like you are fetching the entire resource at at one time, right? Um, like you're fetching, let's say, for example, you have a resource that fetches document with comments or something. Um, it does seem that all of the kind of any kind of optimizations that you would want to do or any kind of security checks that you would want to do might be easier because you a priori know what the final result that the end user wants is, right? Um, except in GraphQL, you you don't know at a code level, you know what what data the user wants. So all of these checks become a little more complicated. Um, do you have any thoughts around that, or like how how to handle how to handle that, um, or, or or how that trade off has been, whether the trade off makes sense? Um, Sasha, for like the um, that's that's a question that I would also like the answer to. Um... I, this this is like a I mean, this is like a GraphQL ex existential question, but um, I think about this a lot. Where, um, like, for example, if if you know, is this person allowed to see this thing or not? You know, this is like something. You know, it's like I block this person, so they're not allowed to see it anymore. And that in and, and that sort of that uh, it's it's works really well with like a rest rest centric um, kind of model. It's like, okay, for this endpoint, these like rules are applied. And so like only, you know, these people are able to access this or whatever. Um, but with GraphQL, it's like, because, you know, you have like ad hoc endpoints now, it's like, how do you apply, you know, certain like, uh, like who can see this rules to every single like ad hoc endpoint, you know, each query that you make, like where, where does that go? And it, it feels like it doesn't really fit as well. I think with REST, it was it's it seems very easy. You're just like, oh, just apply these rules to this endpoint, and that's you know that's there. And but with GraphQL, it's like because you can have so many of these, they're all queries. It's like how do you how do you apply rules like that to queries? And you know, right. um, yeah. I think I mean a lot of people. I think like we're passing in just like parameters, and that's just kind of how it is. It's like we kind of have to take like the REST model and kind of like shove it into GraphQL, and it just it doesn't feel right, but. Um, that's what we've been doing. So I don't know if anyone has a better idea, but I'm also looking for answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've seen that. REST endpoints that do similar checks. Like for instance, like it's not just, okay, we'll just give you the whole payload of data. It's like, okay, well you meet these roles. So your data response is a little bit bigger. You get like some more secure data or you might end up with some like null fields. So we have seen these endpoints that aren't just blanket, like here's the whole resource. And I think the GitHub API is like a good example of that. If you're like logged in, you can see your private repos on the same query yeah. that you would send for all repos and like their REST endpoint is also like that. So I, I'm curious because there is a little bit of that already going on mm -hmm. with like REST, like how how we bring that. Yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Um, on the on on kind of a related topic to like the security aspect, right? The 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 business of like uh, you know the persisted queries thing, right? Like that that solution works really well for. Uh, for for kind of like the client centric or the app centric use case where you know you always know what kind of queries people are going to use if, if you're building a front end application right like by the time you go from staging to production you you are either through some automated tooling or just by brute force of somebody going in and looking at every single module and extracting the graphql queries right you at least have some theoretical way of knowing what queries you're have, going to have to handle in production right uh, which does make a lot of like dealing with this easier uh, but for public facing apis it's hard like like there's no way of like the graphql github api has no way of knowing uh has no way of knowing like what queries they're going to see in production right and they still have to maintain production level like nfrs or or quality of service requirements so um what kind of like what kind of tooling do you have you seen in place right now that a does the persisted queries thing and and ha have are, are, you, are you have you been thinking about approaches or are you Looking at certain approaches where you don't need to use persistent queries, but you know you could do something else. Um, you know, maybe to kick things off, Sasha, what, what kind of the persistent queries mechanism do you have at uh, persistent queries or allow listed queries do you have at uh, Twitter? How does that 
how does that life cycle work um i mean it's not it's not very exciting uh there's not like a ton of tooling around it either um but basically when client folks are uh creating queries they'll create one um and they can test with it um in development and uh basically how our um we are graphical is a little you know a little fancier than the vanilla graphical um but uh, it allows you to save uh queries and it'll give you a query id or basically just like plopping that in a database along with the query itself. So when right. it goes to production, they just, um, you can say like they hard code the the actual oh, yeah. query ID and then we'll do a lookup um, when it comes to the GraphQL server. Ah, okay, um, so the entire so the entire tooling is, so th that's very different though. The entire tooling is like, it's kind of like runtime tooling. It's not, uh, it doesn't it doesn't go through your CI, CD. Like usually the, usually what people, like the usual approaches that I've seen are, you know, people take, uh, they, they kind of do a static analysis on their app. Uh, like either they have like a GraphQL document or something, or with Relay, you have like a Relay compiler that kind of extracts all of these queries. And then uh, a part of like your, the, the process of going live is when you submit like this document of allow listed queries to the server, and then the server has IDs for them. Uh, but it's kind of a part of the, it's a build step. Like every server has a, a finite list of queries that it'll accept as opposed to the check that you're talking about where everything just happens at runtime. People just kind of save their queries, get the query ID and use that query ID in, in production. And then the whole, all of the lookups happen dynamically. Is that, is that how, it, is that correct? Uh, there, there is a list of uh, whitelisted queries. So you can still only make certain queries so that like query ID will get added. Um, right. But we still will, uh, we basically on the GraphQL server will make the lookup for that query ID and unpack it on the server side. Got, um, it, got it. And we'll got do, it. I think we do like uh, validation on that query um, once. Um, and then once we've done it, we'll not do it again until. Um, uh, yeah, until it changes, right? Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Or it's not there. Um, that's very interesting, though. But so it's basically not a part of the build step. There's no like, uh, there's no like dot GraphQL documents file in the source code that gets compiled out. And there's a release that happens with that list of queries, right? It's completely like that, um, that lookup basically happens at, at runtime. Like I can, you know what I mean? Yeah, the, the lookup itself happens at runtime. So we yeah, that query ID will get looked up uh, when the client makes the query. Got it. Got it. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what about uh, what about you, um, Eve and Alec? What kind of things have you seen with the whole allow listing workflow and uh, what do people do? Uh, I don't even know that our. <laughs> I have a feeling. I have a feeling that yeah. your answer is they don't. They that, don't. Yeah. <laughs> I found that they don't. I think yeah. it could be interesting to have tools around that. I see that like uh, if you're a data analyst or something like that, running recurring queries to find out the data that you need to, I don't know, right. populate whatever tool you're working on. But right. at this point, we've seen not a whole lot of that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm looking at you like, have you ever seen that? Because I don't think people have thought <laughs> have gone that far with it. So yeah. Right. right yeah. Um, we we have a we have a fun variant of this tool, which is kind of like what Sasha was talking about, but it's kind of more it's it's kind of based on query capture. Uh, so basically, what happens is that um, as your systems are running in dev or staging or production, uh, the the queries are basically being captured, and then um, and then you can just dynamically add them to uh, an allow list, and then that check will happen at runtime. So. The, the the process is very similar to what, what Sasha was describing, but the, I think the difference is that we don't require the developers to explicitly save the GraphQL query and and then use the ID in their apps, right? Sasha, that's what you were saying. But the, the way it works right now is that as, as if I was the app developer, I would not actually use the raw GraphQL query in my app. In my app, right. I would say GraphQL client ID and then make the fetch. Mm -hmm. Got it, yep. got it. That's interesting. And does that work with like fragments and stuff as well, or on the on the client? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that sounds hard. Also, I'm not sure. Okay, that's very interesting. <laughs> it's, uh, it's always kind of weird talking about Twitter specific stuff. Like, um, Medium's kind of like a, a better example of like probably what like the majority of people are doing. Like, they also didn't do uh, query IDs uh, for the longest time, and that's like pretty right. normal, especially when you're starting out. Twitter is right. so strange because it's like huge and you know there's all these like weird specific things that we have to do. So it's kind right. of weird talking about like, oh, like, well, you store it here and like that's how the clients work. And like, for example, the clients at Medium were obviously all using, uh, I think like Apollo um, for both like, you know, for iOS, Android and for the web client. Right. Um, at Twitter, it's all like homegrown. 
Uh, we don't use Apollo for better or for worse, um, but we've, you know, the client teams have all built their own like parsers and everything. So it's just ah. kind of, you know, it's like, oh, that seems hard. It's like, well, they, they built their own specific thing around <laughs> it. So it works. And yeah, so it's always yeah. kind of weird talking about it because it's like always very, very like, you know, Twitter specific. So I don't know. Sometimes it doesn't like relate as well to like everyone else. Yeah, that may, I've I've been looking at uh, I've been looking at the uh, relay documentation for the last uh, for the last few days, uh, and I've been diving and and there's so many places in the uh, in the docs where it says, uh, yeah, this used to be a thing that used to be required for relay specs, but it's not anymore because it turned out it was just an FBism, like yeah. the the word the word for that peculiar was FBism. So I guess when when Twitter starts kind of like talking more about their tools and open sourcing them, Sasha, wink, wink, hint, hint, uh, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> you can have things like Twitterisms that you know go out with like yeah this is a Twitterism. Um, but that's but that's 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 I think that's uh, that's very interesting. And I think what's the and and are there kind of approaches or things that uh, that that you that you're excited about in terms of like the the dynamic analysis of GraphQL queries or like if you've given that any thought like what kind of approaches seem to make sense that suppose this was a GraphQL API at runtime and we had to decide how to do rate limiting or how to do some kind of like traffic management or quality of service or what queries are allowed and what queries are not. Uh, any, any, any kinds of, or, or maybe just like tools or approaches that you've read that you uh, that, that you'd like to point out. Uh, I, what are you guys even reading these days, huh? How are you spending your quantum time if you're not, <laughs> you're not reading up on the most not. pertinent problem of the denial of service problem with GraphQL? Such a big problem. Everybody's so worried about it. Everybody's freaking out. All the backend enterprise developers are just like, no, this sucks. GraphQL doesn't make sense. I can DOS your server. Here's a query. So yeah, that's that's been a problem. Uh, that's that's literally like the first problem. Every time somebody first time they look at GraphQL, they're like, oh, really? This sucks. Look at this GraphQL query and try executing this. Right, uh, but uh, but yeah, that's so that's that's been a that's been an interesting challenge. I think I think one of the things that I'm most excited about is the um, is kind of like that GraphQL to REST builder. I feel like I feel like that might be a really nice kind of uh, stopgap or bridge, or it might actually just be the final solution as well, right? Where you kind of have these GraphQL query templates that essentially become REST endpoints. That does sound very exciting because it kind of like addresses the Backend developer problem, but it also it also gives you the convenience of GraphQL, where you're kind of like composing that endpoint. Uh, it's almost like it's like a fast REST API creator, right? Where you're just like, oh, here's my DSL. I can create a GraphQL query, map that to a REST endpoint. Um, what's the what is the use case that you have uh, what, that that you're using this for, uh, uh, Sasha? Um, it's mostly for our uh, like our third party APIs. So we have you know customers who want to access uh, like some Twitter data. Um, and so they'll just be provided a bunch of REST endpoints. So it's it's pretty much, um, and this, I mean, I, I'm interested to see how this kind of plays out because in my head, unless people, uh, like everyone starts using GraphQL, it'll probably continue, especially for like, you know, kind of enterprise companies who, you know, want Twitter data or whatever data for like public kind of APIs like that. Um, if they want data, it's probably going to be easier for them if it's through a REST endpoint because those like large companies would also have to switch to GraphQL, which is right. it seems like they probably won't. <laughs> um, but maybe uh, that would be cool. But um, so yeah, uh, it's mostly used for that, and it's powered by the GraphQL uh, our GraphQL server because um, we already ended up providing a lot of the data that it, uh, that that team needed to to build out those REST endpoints. Got it. And is that is that like a is that an almost like a automated service thing that you kind of have a declarative setup where you have like here's my REST endpoint, here are the query parameters that the REST endpoint will take, uh, and you kind of take those parameters and map them into variables in like a templated GraphQL query. You know what I mean? That sounds really cool, but that is that is not what we do. It's <laughs> it's pretty new, um, so it's like very specific and like very you know like by hand. Um, like, you know, it. it's, it's like when you're working with like a uh, third party, you know, companies, it's like, you know, you right. can, you're only allowed like these four things. Um, I right. think some of them are maybe a little, you know, cooler than that, but yeah, it's a, it's a little by hand. <laughs> got it. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah. But I, I feel like that REST API creator thing is quite exciting though. It'd be like just because it, it seems like a very straightforward thing to add to any GraphQL service, right? It's kind of just a, it's like just a new kind of way of doing persistent queries. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. 
um i think that's that's those are those are all of the things that i wanted to discuss um uh, any uh, any questions that any questions that we, you have for each other alex sasha yeah I, I have a question if we're talking about like back and stuff this is just more of an explorative question but one right. of the things about graphql on the front end is we get so much awesome stuff out of automation so it's like if you you know there's great tools like you design a schema will automatically uh, create a model to save the schema and so on and so forth. What type, when it comes to using GraphQL in the back end, especially if you're thinking from like a middleware to middleware uh, situation, right. what like is there a way that GraphQL can be utilized because we do have the types and stuff to automatically compose and automatically put together um, pieces or instances on the back end or something like that? And then my second question was like the mutations they seem like the mutation is almost kind of like the command pattern, right? Because you have a mutation, yeah. the mutation has a name, and then you yeah. get a payload of data with the mutation. Do you see like what types of things do you see us doing in just a back world, back end, you know, internal API world with like mutations? Will we get to the point that like instead of writing, I don't know, a series of commands in Bash or something like that, that we're like actually have like here, follow these mutations and then spit out this query or something? Those are just yeah. things that I was like hypothetically curious of because we do get out of the front and back end communication, we get a lot of automation and cool stuff. And how can you apply that to um, an internal situation? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have I have a few thoughts. But Sasha, do, would you, do you have any thoughts that would like, take that? Uh, not not any thoughts that we probably haven't already covered. So. <laughs> yeah, I think the I think I think you're spot on in the sense like that that mutation pattern is very like a command pattern. And I really like. I think that's something that's resonated with people as well because when they think about, instead of thinking about like the the, if you think about like more of like the the platform use case to GraphQL, more than the resolvers, what you're really interested in is the entities and the actions on those entities. That your framework is not you're not really thinking of resolvers and like how I can fetch the best set of resolvers or compose all of the resolvers or like create that GraphQL query for a good data fetch on my app. But what you're really looking at doing is you're, you're thinking about things in terms of entities and the actions on those entities. Um, and then in that case, it works out really well, especially for mutations or transactions to be like, here's an action on this entity, right? Like, like create record, create health record or like delete health record or reassign or whatever. Right. So, so it's, it's very, that, that terminology is very appealing to think of things in terms of entities and actions on entities. So there's a good, there's a good fit there. I think from the kind of enterprise integration standpoint, I do feel like integrating a GraphQL API is pretty much the same as integrating a REST API. I mean, I don't, there's not, there's not too much of a difference, right? It's just that like, instead of having a URL path based thing, it's more like you have a URL and then you give it a payload. Um, but in terms of like what you have to do with the output, right? If you had like a Swagger specific or an open API or Swagger spec to your REST API, you, you would probably have some automation on the client that would kind of take that Swagger spec and generate like a Java class or something. Uh, for for that rest output or maybe you just deal with that raw json object and then and then i don't know like get attribute whatever whatever dynamic thing you want to do um and I, I feel like graphql is not better or worse if anything it's probably better because there is an opportunity for more standardized tooling than what open api and swagger gave us which was a little bit like which tried to be very standard but i think it's still not very standard i mean there's still like variations here and there so i think from that point of view there's definitely like a huge opportunity for uh, for for GraphQL to add a lot of value in in these kind of like business like service to service or business to business or team to team integrations, right? Uh, I, and I'm I'm very excited about that. But like I I see like for me the from my experience most of the barriers are just like building that GraphQL service and convincing people to do GraphQL is very hard. It almost seems really sad and like as as a quote unquote vendor in the GraphQL ecosystem saying this in public should not be a thing that I say, but it's like the whole world has continuously made things simpler, right? Like we made things simpler when we went from SOAP to REST. But from REST to GraphQL, the complexity does increase a little bit. It's a little bit worrying, right? It's like a little bit worrying because like even things like, for example, if you think like Lambda and serverless, right? They work really well with REST endpoints. Um, but but that entire story doesn't work with GraphQL because with GraphQL the sheer amount of like runtime stuff that you need to do the query caching the the, the state that you need to maintain within a request and across requests is so much that a serverless like environment would just not like it doesn't work well right with like the lambda style of like that innovation that's happening on the lambda ecosystem right where it's oh here's the rest api it's a tiny function it has no state 
but you can't do that with GraphQL because you have to do so much work with GraphQL before you get to the processing of the query. So that worries me a little bit. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to go delete this on YouTube, but you know, anyway, that's me. I think that right there kind of points out, and I think this this took me like forever to realize myself, but like the the main selling point of GraphQL isn't it's like developer productivity. It's like your your client engineers, like everyone's gonna be able to make, you know, things faster. Like they can develop products and products and features so much faster. But like a lot of like everything else becomes more complicated, even to the point where I mean, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but like um, at, at Medium, you were like, okay, everything's going to be way faster. This is going to be awesome. And, then, and that's not necessarily true. And it, it took me so long to figure that out. It's like some some things will be faster, um, but some things won't. And it's kind of like the average of everything is going to be easier. And overall, I think maybe faster. But like if you choose a specific endpoint, now you're writing a query for it, that might be slower. It like yeah. might 100% be slower. And I think that's something that is kind of hard to it was hard for me to like really understand it's like okay this is about developer productivity and like making things faster and it's so much easier and then the price you have to pay is like a lot of other things are harder and i think uh, yeah, yeah like with the lambda stuff it's like yeah now that's harder but like you know your client developers are like way happier so like you know <laughs> that's cool yeah i think that's exactly the thing um a lot of it's learning curve based too Right. Because like I felt like I got into a groove of building apps um, in particular with like Redux, like managing client state and stuff like that. I got into such a groove that I built apps faster than I could ever build them, like using TDD, BDD and stuff. And then I got into GraphQL and it slowed me down. Everything got slower. But then the more I use it, the more I conquer that learning curve. Now I'm just as fast as I would have been previously yeah. but i did yeah. have to like get over this curve i had to learn all of this stuff i had to do a bunch of stuff wrong and to figure out like what the process is but now yeah. if i need to do something i never think like oh i'm going to put up a rest endpoint it's just immediately bam this is the schema let me start building these resolvers and i argue that like i think it's just as fast once you get past that learning curve yeah. when you're building it but it is real syntax heavy so there's that whole thing like writing out all the syntaxes in a query you're definitely like writing that. more code you're definitely writing a little more code than you would have written right so that but i think keeping in line with the theme of like the graphql contributor day stuff that we've been doing it's nice to end on like this therapeutic note where this is more a graphql therapy group more than like a graphql anything else like <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that's good. Uh, but yeah, it, it, I think it, in just terms of like wrapping this conversation up, uh, do you folks have picks that you would like to share with technical, non-technical, just things to do in quarantine? You know, what's your latest quarantine busting trip? Uh, are you, yeah, is there, how's the lockdown situation for you folks and what have you been doing about it? But any picks related to that for, for people who've tuned in would be super nice. Um, Eve, Alex, would you like to go first? I feel like yeah, I, I got a pick, so I can go. Go for it. There's um an alpha. I don't know if you have VR, but if you have virtual reality or Oculus, there's an alpha for a program called Microdose, which is really awesome. And they opened their alpha to Corona for now, so like more people can join this alpha program and install it. And it's kind of like a visual, like concert art style vr thing but it's a lot of fun you just paint like all of these fractals and everything in a vr space and and that's been a fun thing to play with for sure <laughs> it's like a really cool um you had me you out. had me at microdosing so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, several hours yeah. <laughs> in vr you can do but that. yeah you can look up the microdose <laughs> alpha and join the program it's free and then you can also <laughs> help like influence the direction of the software but it's pretty cool stuff that's <laughs> awesome uh eve uh, what do I have? Um, I don't even know. Sasha, you go, and then I'll come up with something. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. I don't have, um, I don't have anything too exciting, but one is, uh, I've found that going outside is very important. You think that you're not, you shouldn't go outside, but you should, you should definitely go outside and like take a walk. Um, also lots of animal crossing. I, I recommend it. So there you go. That's, 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 well, those are my tips. Definitely. <laughs> going outside is something that feels like you shouldn't do it, but it's very good mm -hmm. for your mental health. We went and stood in a field <laughs> yesterday and it was very good for us. It was very like just <laughs> nice to look at a tree, <laughs> see what's going on out there. So we also got some interesting advice too. Um, I, I guess another pick of ours would be a pulse oximeter. We had a really good friend that that got really sick 
um, from this virus. And he's a total, super healthy, like trail runner, skier type dude. So it was really surprising. But what saved his life was the fact that he had a pulse oximeter. So if you are catching, if you catch Corona and you're kind of worried and you're wondering if there's something you could do, you can kind of check your network and see if there's a pulse oximeter because that gave them the reading to know when he needed to go to the emergency room. And his wife was monitoring it. But when his oxygen levels dropped below 90, she called their doctor friend and they were like, take him now. So it's like, that's something there's, I know that it's like a scary time and a scary thing, but I feel like if there's something that you can do, you know, I guess they were a little bit easier to come by before this, but yeah, pulse oximeter is a, another one of our picks. That's, that's right. That sounds, that sounds, uh, that sounds pretty crazy. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, you folks are lucky. I think in my, in my, in my, in my case, I've been for the, for, I, uh, I was in India for a few weeks and I was going to come back to San Francisco, but I couldn't because there was a travel ban and in India, there's like a national lockdown. So you're not supposed to step outside your house unless you go by, unless you have to go buy groceries. So uh, unfortunately, I can only look at animals from my balcony, but that does help. Like just looking at like open spaces definitely helps. So yeah. Anyway, on that uh, bittersweet note, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here, uh, Eve, Alex, Sasha, uh, and uh, hope to see you online. And uh, thank you for everybody who's, uh, who's tuned in. Hope this was useful. Bye, everyone. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.